Hello and welcome back to Unpopular People. We believe that listening and learning from each other is key for personal development and success. Today in our interview, Dave. Dave is from Miami Beach in Florida, in the US, and he's also an artist. If you want to find out more about Dave, listen to this interview. It's going to be very exciting. If you want to find out more about Unpopular People, please visit our website www.unpopularpeople.com and join our community. You can also sign up for our newsletter on our website. And now enjoy this very, very impressive and exciting interview with Dave. Oh my, that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure. I can, I can also change, take one exciting thing out, but I usually say something like this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, no pressure there. Yeah, hello. Uh, All right, so let's get started. All okay. right. Hello, Dave. How are you doing? Oh, I'm very good, Ben. How are you today? Yeah, I'm, I'm very well. Like uh, We met a few weeks ago in hot uh, Miami, uh, Miami Beach, mm. or in Wynwood, where you are uh, mainly based, but you uh, will we'll keep this uh, to the interview. So, um, Our listeners, they don't know you. Like I know you a little bit. We had a few conversations in the past, um, but our listeners don't know you, and this um, uh, podcast is called Unpopular People for a Reason, because that's what we pro want to promote, like the, the artists and the cool people out there that do like impressive stuff and maybe for our listeners to get a brief idea like who you are maybe you can tell us where were you born and how did you grow up well are you sitting down it's a long story <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm sitting down i'm ready <laughs> uh, well um i was born in brooklyn uh, new york and uh i left when i was a tiny little boy so i really really not from brooklyn although i have a lot of people think i have a that they, they think that i'm from new york because i i carry a lot of the culture of new york when I speak and the way I use my hands and everything. And, uh, but we left there when I was very young and uh, I lived in many different places. Uh, I lived in Florida for many years, uh, Central Florida, and then I lived uh, in Cleveland just for a few years and bounced to Boston and then Chicago. I grew up as a young man in Chicago, actually. And I was there 18 years, you know. And uh, then I moved to uh, Brazil. You know, I met a Brazilian woman and uh, Like seven years later, uh, she wanted to move back to Brazil. That's a long story, which I won't get into. But so I did move to Brazil and I was there four years. And uh, then I had to get the hell out of there. <laughs> yeah. It was like, it was interesting, but then I had to get the hell out. Uh, and so, yeah, then I wound up uh, in Miami because, you know, I didn't want to go back up north. You know, like I call it like the tight, tight ass up north, you know, style of living life. I wanted to, you know, I, I fell in love with the Latin style of living, you know, which is in Brazil, you know. Um, and so I, I came to Miami. So I've been here for, Jesus, I've been here 20 years now. Uh, so my schooling was all fragmented, you know, like I went to, uh, so I started off as a photographer. I mean, I knew when I was nine years old, that's what I wanted to do. I mean, so actually younger than that, I remember, I must have been like around five years old, right? And I remember uh, there's this tall man, and this was in the late 60s. And so he had the, I remember the black suit and the black tie, you know, that, that classic look, you know, and the, the, the black glasses. And he had this contraption hanging around his neck. And uh, I remember looking up at him and I, and I was like, what is that? And he was a very kind fellow, I remember. And he looked down at me and he said it was called a camera. And he bends down and he shows me all these mechanisms. And I think it was a Leica, but I'm not 100% certain. When I pieced, I became a photographer and I started getting to know photography, I, I kind of figure out he was he was having he had a Leica around his neck but anyway um so I fell in love with photography at that very moment and uh all the pieces of the puzzle of, of my life came together around photography uh um maybe because I was searching it out but I remember my mother first thing I wanted a Polaroid camera she bought me a Polaroid camera and uh it turned out my uncle my mother's sister's husband uh, was heavy into photography And he had all these cameras and we, he was living up north when we were in, in, in Florida and we'd go up to visit during the holidays, you know, and uh, 
he'd show me his cameras and everything. I became obsessed with it. And so I went to, after high school, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I was in the, I was a photographer for the, for the uh, high school uh, newspaper and things of this nature. And that was in Cleveland. I went to high school in Cleveland. And, um, and then I wanted to scramble. And so I, I found a photography school in Boston. And uh, so I wound up going to a little like trade school, two year trade school in Boston, actually. And it was, it was just like nuts and bolts kind of school. You know, it was nothing fancy. Uh, and if anybody knows Boston, it's under that famous Sitco side. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen that, but um, so that's where the school was. And you had international students from Australia and Germany and, and from all over. They were already mature. So I was pretty young because everybody else, uh, they were already living their life and they decided they wanted to get into photography, whatever, you know. And, uh, so that's really where I started um, my creative endeavors, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned your mom already. So um, was she involved into like taking pictures as well, or is your, was your dad involved in this, or like any sort of art, or like do you know where this where this obsession or passion for like taking pictures and using the camera comes from? Uh, you know, I really don't know. I mean, you know, um, I was told that my first father. I didn't know my first father. Uh, my mother divorced and went to Florida when I was just a, like a child after Brooklyn, and. Uh, so, but she said that he was creative, that he was an artist. Uh, but this is all I know. Superficially, that's all I know. Um, so the obsession came from something else, you know, to something, this narrative inside me that was, that was ticking. And it took one incident somehow to uh, get that seed to start growing, which was that camera around that man's neck, let's say. Um, but later I started realizing that I'm just built to create all the time. As I remember, even when I was a little boy, I would make my own toys, um, like my own spaceships and things like that out of cardboard or whatever. So I, maybe all kids do that. I don't know. But, um, yeah, I've just, yeah, creating uh, is just a big part of my life. And then photography, which is still part of my life, is my, my main narrative, I guess you could say. At least that's what I feel. I, I don't know if that's true or not. And this capturing of of um, of something visual, like um, so, is there any any sort of technique that's um, that you use or something that you did you think uh, this is my type of style, like how I take pictures, or do you just do like whatever comes in into your visual f uh, field and you just uh, try? Oh, that looks cool. So do you take a picture, or do you do you approach it from from a more like like from your style, like from your type of pictures you want to take? Hmm. <clears throat> well, you know, I am, I'm obsessed with space uh, and framing space. So I'm constantly seeing, seeing uh, forms and angles that uh, have uh, like a composition. I'm trying to find the composition. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I feel like the, I, yeah, I'm definitely obsessed with taking pictures. There's no doubt about it. I see pictures constantly, and I can manufacture pictures out of nowhere, out of thin air. I can manufacture a picture in any situation, and that's what I actually try to tell people all the time. Like I had this one young person come in the the shop the other day, and uh, she had a camera around her neck, an analog camera, film camera, you know. And she goes, "Oh, I had to leave the where I was at, which was in Portland, Oregon, or Portland, Maine, because I wasn't inspired there, you know." And I said, I started telling her, I said, I beg to differ. You can be inspired uh, anywhere. You just have to learn to see. And once you learn to see and learn also technique, skill, you know, so like the camera, for example, uh, lenses, focal lengths do different things to, uh, to uh, uh, an, uh, a scenario. And uh, so you, if you marry two things, skill and how to see, you can create pictures instantly, you know. Um, I hope that answers your question. Already, I think but. I can understand what you mean. Like, uh, I mean, this is like I was always um, surprised. Like, you know, my cousin and he's he's taking pictures as well, and um, he um, and he does lots of other things too, like yourself. But um, what I've always found fascinating, like when he took a picture, he always 
took it from an angle that I would have not expected it to come from. You know, like he mm -hmm. was always like when when you when you think of like oh we can take a picture here and then you think like oh <coughs> you know like you stand there and like you're facing this way like how I would like make it up in my head and he always came up with a new idea. That's why I was interested yeah. in like how how you approach it. Like do you approach it like with the oh. with the light and I I think also like when you said earlier oh, yeah. you, you use you use a lot of you think of space. You know, like you look at something yeah. and even if it's like like a corner or something you you can make something nice out of it by taking a picture yeah. in a certain way so, geometry whatever yeah uh, yeah i mean for sure uh uh it was you know, i was always obsessed with finding something new in imagery as well with photography and uh like when i started out um i remember i befriended this iranian fellow actually where i where i was uh I, the first the first few months as a professional photographer after graduating school i i left boston i went to chicago and um um there i befriended a, a um an iranian man and we worked at a catalog studio and it was nothing interesting but he was an interesting guy because he's the one who actually started me off at seeing something new so he took me to an international bookstore and i remember seeing these uh, fashion magazines from italy and i was floored by the italian way of phot photographing fashion or anything actually uh, they had such great spirit in their work you know and being an american americans at that time had a tendency and still do to be very technical oriented we're very skilled at what we do uh, very proficient uh, but that doesn't necessarily translate to something that has spirit it's just technical so i started marrying the Italian way, uh, which I call an emotional way or passionate way of photographing, with the skills of, of, of the American style of photographing. And I created something called the Selective Focus, which, I, as far as I know, I was the only one doing that. And uh, I started to blow up. People started recognizing that. And I started working at a very, very young age. I was like 22 when I started working. And, uh, you know, I started uh, doing a Selective Focus, and people had never seen it before. And um, with selective focus, let me just back up. What selective focus is, uh, is, so I use large format camera, and you're able to use the front and the back port. You can tilt and swing. I don't know if you're familiar with large format cameras, uh, but the, the front lens is independent from the back where you put your film in. It's large format. And so you can tilt and swing your front and back port at different angles. So what you're doing is you're controlling the plane of focus from the from the from the back to the front because there's different planes of focus uh, in in from the nearest point to the farthest point. So basically, I was able to through selective focus uh, control how you look at a photograph uh, focus wise. So if there's something in the so something in the foreground can be out of focus, and something in the mid depth could be in focus and something in the background can be in focus and then in between all that can be something in focus it's it's hard to explain without actually looking at an image to be quite frank with you but anyway having said all that uh yeah i just created this new technique that hadn't been used before and so um, i'm always looking to create something fresh and, and with a unique perspective i guess you could say okay very cool and um also like f all this this knowledge about uh, cameras and this knowledge about like how to do it uh, properly or how to see things with, like how, how your friends said to you that um uh, that she can't find any anything to take a good picture and you told her like oh yeah there's, there's things everywhere you just have to learn how to look properly so um all mm -hmm. this knowledge um did you do you remember someone you what who was a role model for you for those type of things do you do you remember anyone in your life that was like gave you ideas or things? I mean, that uh, you told us about the Italian magazines and things, but is, was there a particular person, or did you have like a mentor or something concerning this? Um, not I, you know, I, no. I mean, to me, everybody's my mentor. You know, like I, everybody I talk with has something to say or or shows me something that that i can find interesting about it and it i mean in terms of famous people like yeah i mean okay um it, so i didn't know these these people personally only through images right so irving penn for example i don't know if you know irving penn but he was a great still life photographer um and now i think his time was maybe 50s and 60s into the maybe 70s i don't remember exactly don't quote me on that but irving penn was 
when I saw his images, I was like, wow, this is awesome. And yeah. he was like, we surely, we surely yeah. linked this in the show notes afterwards for people to find out more. Yeah. yeah. And then there was other people too, you know, like uh, Richard Avedon, you know, I loved his work, you know, and, uh, um, and then painters, I, you know, I just, uh, people who really inspired me uh, were like Matisse, for example, you know, I mean, I just loved his style of, of painting and, and how he, what he was capturing in his paintings, you know, and I try to mimic that actually in my, in my photography. Um, in fact, there was one famous artist, uh, he was a Brazilian artist, he was very famous, he was looking at one of my pictures and it goes, wow, that looks like a painting, you know, and that stuck with me as well, you know, so... Yeah, those are kind of my influences. Everybody's an influence to me in some way, you know. Yeah, cool. No, that's that's very cool. That that's what we want to hear on this show. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, well, it's true. And also, um, like, do you do you know if you are um, nowadays if you became um, some sort of mentor or role model to other people, and or do you teach people in fo uh, photography, or do you teach people mm. in in like the the way you do art? Do you have something like this set up? Well. Um, I used to. Um, so a after I left, uh, after I left Brazil, I quit photography. I lost my heart for it, and um, for many different reasons, which we can talk about if you want to. But I, I, um, I, lo I lost my heart for it commercially, and uh, I decided I wanted to be an artist, a visual artist, you know. And um, and uh, when I got, got moved to Miami Beach after Brazil, there was an art center, and. Uh, through my my then wife Adriana, she was she's a real artist. I got her in because I uh, let me back up a little bit. Okay, so when I was in Brazil, I decided after I was going broke that I wanted to come back to Miami, and I figured I'd just be a photographer again because I could just pick up where I left off, right? And uh, that's not how life works. And um, but so I had agents in New York, and I had agents in Chicago before I left, which I dropped, of course, when I moved to Brazil. And I started contacting them again after a four-year hiatus. And my New York uh, agent, she was like, well, Dave, you know, you've been gone. You know, <laughs> I'm kind of full now, you know. And uh, I'm like, okay, no problem, you know. But I had this incredible portfolio. You know, I did international ads. I, I, I really kicked ass, you know. And um, so I had this incredible portfolio. I thought, yeah, no problem. I'll just come back and start, you know, banking again, right? So I came back to Miami, which I knew Miami wasn't a really commercial town, right? And um, it wasn't big on photography for sure. But so I got my first job I got, as soon as I got, I landed, I went to the, uh, what's it called? Um, Ocean Drive Magazine. And it's like the fashion kind of cosmopolitan magazine of Miami Beach, right? Or Miami in general. But um, they gave me a, a, an assignment to do a portrait of a woman who was the director of the art center. And so... I, w I met her and we hit it off and I showed to her uh, my then wife Adriana's portfolio of work because I brought that with just in case. And she was like, wow, this is amazing work that she does. Like, yeah, yeah. So Adriana got into the art center because I got her in. And of course, her work was brilliant, you know, but I was able to introduce her, you know. And then after three years after moving back, uh, I worked on my art portfolio and then I got in. And then at that point, I started to teach photography because it's a good way to earn income. But also I just, I like the idea of, I like the idea of passing on what I know to somebody else. Uh, so I started doing a class there. Um, it was all uh, film, you know, how to process, how to take pictures, how to process your own film, the basic rudimentary uh, uh, skills of photography, you know. And I did that for five years and I built up an incredible following of people uh, They would take my class after class after class. It was only a, I forget how many weeks it was. I don't remember. It was like a two month, yeah, maybe a eight week class. And the, and the, the same people would sign up over and over again for five years because we built up this wonderful like uh, camaraderie, you know. And, and I'm not the kind of person that, oh, I'm, I'm a teacher. I'm just teaching you, you know. I learned from them, right? That's what I was saying before. Everybody's my mentor. So, you know. Uh, we had this incredible uh, relationship that was forming with all these people, but then there were also new people coming in like uh, uh, over the five years as well. And they wouldn't always sign up again. You know, they would drop out after one class, whatever. So I, mean, I love the idea of teaching, right? And in terms of your question, have I ever been a mentor? Yes, I have been a mentor and I've had people come to me later and tell me that they became an artist because of me or I became a photographer. Oh my goodness. Uh, 
It's this one woman that she, I had a relationship with her after I divorced Adriana. She forced her way into my life, you know, for like a month and a half. And I saw that she was really good at taking pictures, you know? I was like, wow, do you notice that you're good at taking pictures? And she goes, no, I never noticed. I said, yes. And I told her why. I started showing her in her pictures why she's good at what she is, what, what she does. And well, now she blew up. She's doing pictures internationally, magazine covers, and she's in LA and she goes to Berlin. Yeah. So cool. I, I, That's very yes. nice. Yeah. 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 <laughs> It's nice to hear. Anyway. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes you have to show people what they are good in, so they, uh, you know, approach it from this angle as well. Because sometimes I think people don't understand that they're really good in something in particular. They, like, you, for example, like your friend, you said, like, yeah, oh, she's been taking pictures, and you showed her in the pictures what are, what are the good things, you know, like what what she's doing well. And I think sometimes um, this is needed, you know, like sometimes we don't shouldn't just tell people what they're bad in. We should tell them what they're good in. So, so they continue. Yeah. In this sense. <laughs> well said. Yeah. In that case, you can't be selfish, right? I mean, you have to give of yourself. You have to say, well, I'm going to observe you and see that you're good at something. You know, I, I enjoy that. And I and I'm still doing that today in the shop. Young people come in. You know, they want to get into in, Well, the shop is not photography the shop is you know it's an art shop right uh, so i get these young fashion designers coming in and they want to know my opinion for some reason and i'll tell them flat out what i think you know they'll show me their work whatever you know um and i'm not saying that my opinion is, is gold or anything but I, i'm willing to tell the truth you know i'm willing to tell them what i see is good and also i think it's important to tell them what i don't think is so good absolutely yeah, yeah. And it's balance right yeah <laughs> All right, before we go uh, more into your shop, because I think that's a very um, interesting topic as well, but you mentioned Brazil a few times, and <laughs> you said, like, if you want, you can tell me the story. And yes, I want you to tell me the story about Brazil. Like, why did you go down to Brazil, and what was the reason for you to come back? And of, you said you became, you mm -hmm. were broke at some stage, but so, yeah. like, tell us, tell us the story. Well, so I met uh, Adriana, Brazilian woman, and... Uh, She said when we first got together that, you know, uh, uh, she would want to go back to Brazil. And of course, you know, I said, sure, sure, no problem. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, anything to get the woman, you know, that kind of thing. And it, but years later, like seven years later, she said, yeah, you know, she's been wanting to go back to Brazil. And keep in mind, um, I was visiting every year my vacations. We'd go down to Brazil and I'd spend a month down there. And, uh, so I got to know the, the country and, and the style of living. And, and I really enjoyed it. And I was known, you know, the I, people knew my work down there, the advertising agencies. Uh, they knew, uh, you know, I had a certain amount of fame built up, right? Uh, and uh, so the my ex-wife, Adriana, I'll call her former wife, she... Uh, was well connected through friends um, and they were in the advertising uh, business so she had me meet all the owners of the agencies if you can imagine I mean this is like really huge uh, I can think it was huge but you know, I can be a little naive about how important people are in this world you know because I talk to everyone equally right um, but I guess it was a big deal and, and they said oh yeah they, we know your work or they said yeah your work is we don't have that here so you'd be welcome to come here because we were talking about moving there. You know? So that was sort of like planting the seeds. And then the time came where we, we decided we'd make the big move. And uh, so I got a 20 foot container and I packed my studio and Adriana's studio. She had an art studio and uh, we moved down there. And uh, uh, when we got down there, basically what was happening is I wasn't working at all. They wouldn't work with me. And it was, Bizarre. I didn't understand that, right? Uh, and I'm a humble guy. I tried speaking, you know, uh, Portuguese. I started speaking Portuguese. I, I threw myself into the fire, so to speak, you know, and only communicating in, in, in their language, you know, because I didn't want to be like this arrogant American, you know, like, here I am, you know, bop, 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 let's do it. No, no, I mean, I'm not that style. And But they didn't want to work with me. And I find out that it's, it's not like that. There's like, they want you when you're not there. But when you're there, then you're under their control. And they have this attitude in Brazil, like they're the, the powerful people, the people who have, they're the puppet masters. And everybody else are puppets, you know. And that's my impression. And I think a lot of Brazilians would 
would agree with that. Um, and I, I didn't like that. That just goes against everything I believe in. You know, I believe in merit, you know, meritocracy. Uh, but that's not how they do things in that country. Uh, so my character back then was fighting against that, you know, and um, uh, I really wasn't working. I did some magazine work, which didn't thrill me. Uh, it was subpar kind of assignments, you know, and I, I just was getting bored. And at the same time, while I'm down there, uh, we, I had rented this huge house because I had, well, I had American money. And at that time when I moved there, uh, there was uh, the, what do what they call it when the, mon- the money uh, deflates? Their money, they had deflation. So it was uh, five of their local money to one dollar right when I moved there. So I was able to rent this huge house, which I rented not because I just wanted a huge house, but because I needed a studio to work out of. And they didn't have like lofts in Chicago, you know, they just didn't, that didn't exist really in Brazil. And um, so I rented a big house and this huge room, you know, and, uh, so that was my studio. And we had an upstairs, we had four, it's actually a pretty incredible house now that I think about it, you know, we had four suites <laughs> upstairs, you know, and one of the suites, I had all these props that I brought down with me, which was painting supplies, because I did photo shoots of, of you know, with paints, you know, a photographer, a studio photographer, you have to have supplies for everything that might come up, you know, and I started painting. And then I said, okay, Jesus, a, a switch turned on, you know, I was getting bored and tired of photography. I lost my heart for it. And then that was the transition that I was going through all my money because I wasn't working. And I had, I, I went with like, Jesus, I don't remember, like $100,000. And it was almost all gone. You know? And I was like, oh shit, that's when I decided to come back. You know? Oh, wow. Okay. And um, so, so how did you meet Adriana? Um, did you meet her in, in the US or did you meet her down there? Like during the holiday, you said you, you spent most of your vacation down there or... Um, no, I met her in Chicago. Yeah, she had a distant relative that lived there. And the guy who developed my uh, black and white, I didn't have my own dark room. I didn't want to do my dark room work uh, when I was a commercial photographer. I wanted to devote my time to other things that are more important, like taking pictures. So I had this uh, dark room guy that would develop my black and white film and he printed up and all that. And he was Brazilian. And uh, there was a party. Uh, And uh, he invited me to, and then she was at the party because I guess they knew each other through. Oh yeah, his partner, his partner in the darkroom business was on the same plane as Adriana when she was coming to the United States, and he invited her to a party, <laughs> and that's how that happened. And I met her at a party. Okay, cool. Yeah, and which which part of um, Brazil did you spend most of the time? In like, was it like further down south of Florianópolis, or was it like in Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro? Yes, no, Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, yeah. it's a city of, of commerce, you know. Yeah, it's a massive place, <laughs> like 20 million or something. Yeah. <laughs> have, have you been there? Yeah, I've been to Sao Paulo. Yeah, I stayed in yeah, Sao yeah. Bernardo do Campo. Um, oh yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's uh, like a suburb of some sort, I guess. You'd yeah, call it's it. a suburb. It's like. Um, Closer to the ocean, but it's still like a two-hour drive, you know. I mean, but this, this, yeah. the city is just so big. I mean, it's it's just incredible. It's not only in size, you know. Like you have Los Angeles, where you have, uh, of course, like a f- many million people living as well. But it's also like the size of Los Angeles is very very mm. big. And um, mm. I think in Sao Paulo, you have both. You have like lots of people and the size of the city, which is which is really crazy. I find I find, but yeah, wow, mm, yeah. And yeah, the Sao Paulo is an interesting city. It, it's it smells bad because you know they have this uh, the river, the Tietê, I believe it's called, and the Pinheiros that's that go through the city, right? And it's like you know sewage basically. Maybe they cleaned it up, but I remember the stench was pretty horrific, you know. Uh, but I always used to say that Sao Paulo, the beauty of Sao Paulo is it, it's in the details. You know, it's in the little neighborhoods, you know. Um, but as a city itself, it's pretty ugly. Yeah, true. I agree. But also, um, so um, did you did you spend all your time there, or did you did you also travel around Brazil a little bit? Yeah, we traveled a little bit. Uh, I went to the nor- Nordeste, um, you know, Fortaleza, places like that. Mostly beach towns, I'd say. Uh, and I went to Bolivia once. And unfortunately, you know, that is 
Um, one thing that I, I wish I could have done more of would be travel and see South America, right? I, I was just so obsessed with, um, at the time, was uh, working in photography, you know, um, and meeting people constantly that I, I lost sight of the bigger picture of where I was at, you know, and I lost out on it. And you, um, how old were you when you went to Brazil and um, uh, how much time did you spend in total there? And um, so like uh, when, you, when you came back, you said you were still married to Adriana. Did you get married down there or did you come back uh, to the U.S. to get married? Or did you do no, we married in Chicago. Yeah, yeah we married. I, I, see, I, I married her when I was 29 and seven years later, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a mathematician. We moved to Brazil and I was there four years. So that puts me someplace like around, what is that? Uh, 36 to 40. Uh -huh. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Okay. And then when we, we moved back here, uh, we were still married. We, we divorced uh, a few years later. Um, after, actually, after our dog died, we had this dog that we took from. We, we adopted this dog in Chicago, and uh, she was our baby, you know, the sweetest thing in the world. Papaya, her name was Papaya, you know. And Papaya was my shadow 24-7, you know. And she, so Papaya was really important. She was our baby when she died. Our relationship sort of started disintegrating after, after she passed, you know. Um, so, yeah, a few years later, then we divorced. I'm not sure about time exactly when that was, but it was a few years after being in Miami Beach. Mm. But you're still friends uh, with her? Oh, yeah. I mean, she, you know, she, we've known each other for, well, Jesus, like 30 years, something like that, you know. Um, uh, she's my best friend, you know, and uh, you, you, you build up trust, right? And as a creative person or any person, really, you need to have somebody that you can trust, uh, that you can open yourself up to, right? And it seems so frivolous and superficial to be with someone and share so much and say, okay, you know, we're, we can't be husband and wife anymore. Ciao, you know, goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's not how I operate. You know? Yeah, I know it's a really weird behavior. I don't, I don't really get this too. Sometimes it's, I mean, it, with some, because it really depends how the relationship finishes as well. You know, like sometimes it's, you know, not the best ending. <laughs> Let's call it like this. Yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, still, like I, I think you're absolutely right because you share so much during your relationship, and I, I think it's sometimes sad to let everything go because of ego or whatever it causes you to not want to spend Dude. time with the other person anymore. Um, yeah, you said it right there, ego, right? Yeah. That, that's the biggest word. Yeah. And what, what advice can you give to um, people? I think nowadays it's also a bit harder to be a photographer because of um, things like with your iPhone and, you know, you have a camera 24-7 mm -hmm. on you like all the time and uh, Instagram and, uh, and what are they all like the whole like i don't know there's probably more post what's the other yeah. like, platforms called where you p uh, post all your pictures and stuff on it there are there are a few oh, yeah. so um yeah. pinterest is this called like pinterest oh uh, yeah <laughs> and visco or something like that yeah. i forgot the name of yeah there, there's so many so what advice could you give to people that are obsessed like yourself with taking pictures um and like since an early age and they want to be you know successful or want to do like wow. uh, the right thing so is there anything you could tell them um, that's an interesting question, uh, because yeah, it is overwhelming, uh, the, the opportunities that people have just to show their work before it's ready. Um, uh, I think it, one thing is learn, learn to have, learn how to edit. Um, you know, I'll pepper in comments once in a while, uh, on Instagram, I'll see people, uh, they'll post several pictures. Uh, even professional photographers, uh, they appear to be professional. I'm pretty sure they're professional. Anyway, they'll post multiple pictures, you know, a slide, whatever it is. And I'll look at the whole slide and I'll say, why don't you just choose one picture? You had one really good picture there. Just learn how to edit, I'll say, you know. And I'll say something positive, of course, that I really love that picture, which I did. But Jesus, all the other ones are making that other one disappear. So I would say, yeah, just Jesus, learn to edit. You know, I mean, there's a lot of things I could probably say, believe me, uh, if I started dwelling on it. But um, that would be the main one, you know, and I don't know. I, you know what I think also, by the way, I, I, maybe I touched on this with you at the shop. I don't remember. But um, so I think I think everybody has this narrative inside them that, that's ticking away all the time, you know. And um, I, I tell the story 
because I think this is a good example of it. Um, there was this, when I was teaching photography at the art center, there was this, there was this uh, uh, young girl, she was 14 years old, I think 14. And uh, she got a grant to take my class, you know, and she was from some poor background, you know, and she wanted to continue her classes in photography. And so she took mine and, and immediately I saw that she didn't, know how to handle her negatives and i started off you know first of all you know like teaching her how to how to properly take care of film and and then i started seeing her photographs and i started noticing that in her photographs there was this repetitive image that kept emerging constantly and i pointed it out to her and she was like she didn't know and people usually don't see that you know you have to point it out to them and now i I don't think it's that maybe a a life-changing thing but i guess my point is that uh, sometimes if you don't see it yourself, this narrative that's inside you, somebody else needs to see it inside you. That's where the trust factor comes in. And so every photographer might be good at something, that they're not good at something else. So I have this other friend. Uh, um, she takes great pictures of portraits. She does really wonderful portraits of people. But she insists on taking other types of pictures. That's not her strong suit. And... I'm like, I don't know why people have to do that. They always want what they don't have. It's like, you have this incredible skill. Why don't you take portraits for God's sake? You could blow up, you know? But no, they're not happy with that. They want something else. So I think that's it, is, is learn to see what you're good at and learn how to edit. <laughs> yeah, that's, an, that's something which I think is really important to tell others sometimes, yeah? And also, um, with your experience living in, in Brazil and having a job there as a photographer and everything, so is there any, like, if you, if you leave your country, not to leave your country behind, you know what I mean, but if you leave your country to go to another place and, you know, try something else and it's always exciting and a bit scary and everything, and um, do you think this is, this is an important step to make for most human beings that they, like, go to the other side and see what's happening there and what advice can you give to them if they're struggling with doing this very important step? Hmm. Hmm. You know, that's interesting. Um, I think for you Europeans, I think you're surrounded by different cultures, right, and different languages. So maybe for you guys, maybe it's not as important, but I think for Americans, I think it's really important to see the rest of the world and see how they live. Um, because I think we, we're isolated here, generally speaking. Um, so yeah, I was, for me, it was uh, an eye-opener to uh, learn about myself uh, living in Brazil. And I traveled a lot, too. Well, a lot. Depends on what is a lot to, to you, right? And, uh, but I traveled enough to realize that that there's a, these vast different cultures out there. And there's, there's so much depth of talent everywhere in the world, you know? Uh, so everywhere I go, I'm impressed. I was in, I had a show in Guatemala City, and uh, the gallery was showing me some of the local artists, you know, contemporary artists. And I was like, wow, I was floored by their vision and their skill. You know, they mar- to me, that's what real art is. It's when you marry vision and skill, and they had both. And I was like, wow, this is very impressive. But yeah, to answer your question, yeah, you probably know that better than I do because you live in New Zealand and you travel the world more than I do. Um, do you feel that? As I said, though, do you feel like Europeans don't need to travel as much because you're surrounded by all these different cultures? Um, I think this with traveling itself, it's it's a very interesting uh, conversation uh, we should definitely have because uh, it really depends on the person. That's what I feel. I don't think you can um, nail it down to... Um, you know, like uh, where the, where people come from. So I, I think even in Europe, like I know so many people where sometimes when I have a conversation with them and I think to myself, man, you should travel a bit more because then you would understand why people react the way they do and why politics are the way they are and why, you know, like some decisions are made um, in, in this in this way because... Yeah, if you if you if you get to know people, if you get to know the world, um, then you you understand things better. But I also understand that there are some people that just can't do it, and um, they are they are really afraid, and they also um, they are also really happy um, in the like situation or in the position where they are right now. And I would never take it away from them. Like I have like very mm. close, uh, good and close friends, and they don't like to travel. They live in like in the same town uh, we were born in. They have a house there. They have a family and, and kids and they're happy exactly how they are. And I would never tell them like, Hey man, you should go <laughs> leave yeah. your family behind and go yeah, traveling, yeah. you know? So yeah. it's, so it's really it's, like, it, it yeah. Depends on, yeah. 
Yeah, I guess it depends on what you do, right? I mean, if you're in the arts, I guess you need to uh, embrace so many different ideas and cultures, maybe. I don't know. But yeah, if you just want to raise a family, I yeah. live your life, right? And I also, like, what I, what I see with Europeans or, like, Germans um, uh, very often is that they go away when they are really young. So they go to travel for for a few years or maybe one year to, like, work and work a holiday in, in Australia or, like, some like country with a western um like a society but more um you know like with a different environment so for example like australia has lots of beaches and diff bit, bit of different lifestyle but it's still very western you know like something we can relate to mm -hmm. as, as europeans or as germans and then um afterwards they um, sometimes just go back uh, and just do the same thing what everyone else does and yeah and then i i i asked them questions like um did you see anything of Europe? Did you see anything of Germany? <laughs> you know, did you see any? Uh, did you travel around Germany before you went to Australia? And usually they say no, which is a bit sad because <laughs> I think like uh, you should know your neighborhood before you yeah. you know like go to uh, That's other places. But yeah, um, no, I, I find I find it very cool to like also hear from from your side like when you you say as, as an American like um, you think um, you need to travel a bit more and, and yeah, and I agree. Like I think. We are like born as nomads, like a homo sapien is a nomad by heart, you know, like all of us are. And um, just like industrialization or like uh, whatever you want to uh, make responsible, uh, um, responsible for this, you know, that we are living in houses now and living at the same place for most of our lives, like most of the people. I think, yeah, it's mm -hmm. important to travel. So, um, and but I also understand that many people are scared. That's why I'm, I'm very interested in your point of view mm. especially going to brazil i know brazil and it can be quite rough especially mm. like there are areas where you just can't go to and i mean miami has some rough areas too but i don't know if you can uh, <coughs> compare it to like a favela in sao paulo <laughs> no i i do have this thing about when i travel i have a tendency to to have this uh, to to be in a little bubble rightly or wrongly i don't know you know like when i was in guatemala city for example Uh, have you been to Guatemala City? No, have unfortunately not. No. Uh, well, it's a pretty scary city. It's very dark and uh, like gray, like ash gray. Uh, at least when I was there, uh, all the buildings are really nondescript, generally speaking, you know. And out front of all the shops, they have this guy with a double barrel shotgun everywhere you go because it, they don't have, a, like, I guess, a police presence, right? And, um, but, Everybody told me, you know, the gallery owners and my driver, he said, oh, you, you, you it's dangerous. And, you know, you, you uh, they say this in Brazil, too. Now, don't walk anywhere. You can't walk, you know, at night, especially. And I'm like, well, you know, then that doesn't seem the right way to experience anything. And uh, in Guatemala, they have what they call zones. And uh, I think there are 10, if I remember correctly. And I walked every zone, you know, at, And I stopped and I'd go into a bar and I would chat with the, the bartender or whoever else was there, you know, a gringo in town, you know, a local little bar, you know, a, a hole in a wall. And it was no problems, you know, and uh, the same thing in Brazil. I just kind of walked, I'd whistle, you know, like I'm whistling down the street. Like this is, yeah. And everybody was kidnapped or people were shot at. And people that I know, Adriana, this one kid stuck his hand in, the, in while she was driving. I wasn't there. Stuck his hand in the window with a broken bottle, you know, next to her neck. Give me everything you have. So everybody I knew had things happen to them. And there I am, you know, this green girl with blue eyes, you know, walking around whistling. So I was fortunate, you know, I guess, I don't know, maybe it's my attitude, you know, you know. Yeah. Well, everything's good. I can relate to this as well because like when I was in Brazil like I also I, I did things where everyone warned me about like oh don't take your phone out and don't do this and don't like you know and like, I mean I was very fortunate I guess to you know and I like also lucky but I mean aren't we all the time you know when you go to the shower mm -hmm. like you can slip and fall and can break your neck if you go to work by car you know <laughs> like you can have a car crash I mean it, it's like so many things happen every day um, and I think yeah, you can either be fortunate or unfortunate but I I think if those things or those stories stop you from going to a place yeah I don't know mm -hmm. like it's it, there are places where you know you have to be like more 
careful than in other places, of course, you know. And there's, Indeed. And there are things like, you know, I always compare it with uh, the, the spiders and the snakes in Australia when people say like, oh, don't go to Australia because you get eaten by a shark or get uh, bitten by a uh, snake or a spider or whatever. Mm. And I always say like, hey, I don't know, like if, to, if you follow some simple rules, like don't put your hand anywhere where it is, um, you know, where you can't see, you know, this is, this is something yeah. you should probably start with and then the the chances of getting bitten or don't swim in somewhere in the danger rainforest where it says mm. like a, on a sign like oh there are crocodiles and you swim in a lake where you can't see the ground you know <laughs> so, so, yeah i mean if, if you do it's those true <laughs> you know it's really funny when i was a little boy we used to go to these florida mud holes you know and back then i didn't know this but they were teeming with alligators But we were all these kids, like eight, nine years old, you know, and there'd be a whole bunch of us diving off of swings, you know, like the kind of you see like trees around and there's like a rope and you have, and you swing into the lake, you know, and there were alligators everywhere, you know, but yeah, you're just like innocent in a way, you know. Um, but getting back to this fear thing, you know, it, it is interesting that like, I think we do have this privilege of you being from Germany and let's say, uh, or New Zealand, I guess has the same thing in America in these first world, quote unquote, Uh, environments, we have police presence, right? So it's easy for us to say that, you know, and I know what their reaction would be. Like, yo, Dave, you don't really live here on the regular, and even though I did live there on the regular. Uh, but I, I, I learned a long time ago uh, not let fear paralyze me from doing what I want. Do you know? I remember, ex actually, I remember when I came to this conclusion, uh, I was working as a school photographer. I wanted to be a school photographer. I wanted to just do photography, you know, and I want to do this. I figured out the school newspaper. That's the only option for me, you know, and I was really shy because I had moved around so much in my life that, you know, one home to another home. So it was hard for me to make solid friends, you know, and have this continual relationship. So I was insecure. And uh, I remember like, Dave, you're going to go in front of like, hundreds of people in front of like basketball games and they're going to be staring at you, you know? And I remember thinking, wow, this is going to be really frightening. And I said, no, you got to do it. Don't care. And I remember, yeah, that's, that's when I made the decision, not let fear paralyze me. You know, that you just don't look back on that. It carries with you, you know, throughout your life, that kind of attitude, I think generally. So are you just saying like, that's how you manage uh, to be um, not stage frightened anymore is this uh, so you you had like you were holding big speeches in in front of big crowds and everything and you were afraid of it before but you told yourself not to be afraid anymore and then you did it um yeah you know i mean jesus christ i don't know if you really ever get over it you know but you learn how to control it um so i sort of let my so when when i when i was doing photography also getting back to that i was always really nervous before a shoot And what I realized, all these, this nervous energy that was uh, bouncing around inside my brain, I would utilize it. And I, would not to, I wouldn't let the nervousness paralyze me. So I would use this energy to be creative. Because if you think about it, when you're nervous, your mind is going a million miles a second, right? Bouncing from one thing to another. And if you can control that somehow, uh, to uh, use it to your advantage, uh, I think that's when you can conquer fear because you, you go into the zone. At least that's what I did. I went to a zone and, and my mind was working on creating and like, I don't miss a beat, you know? So I didn't let it paralyze me. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. Can you go a little bit more into detail, like how you do it, like how you get into the zone? Do you use like certain techniques or do you tell it yourself or did you learn it somewhere? Did you, are there any books or any things that people can no. relate to? Not really. I mean, I just become a vortex, you know, I, that's the right expression. Uh, when I see something, a picture, I, if, when I see a scene, and, and uh, if, if it's just like outdoors, let's say, you know, or not constructing a scene indoors, but it's basically the same emotion. There's this tunnel vision that I start getting that everything in the peripheral, I kind of ignore. You know, people can be talking and everything, and I could be responding maybe, but I'm not really listening. My focus is on what I, what's right in front of me, you know. Uh, maybe that's a masculine energy, you know. And uh, where the feminine energy is like everything, right? Everything in the kitchen sink. They're focusing on everything. They're multitasking. But I don't. I'm really, I call it the masculine energy. And I'm just like zeroed in on something. And so that's what I do. And it's just natural, I think. I, I don't really think about it. 
it just happens. It pulls me in like a like a magnet. Interesting. And you um, you also you lived in different uh, places, right? So you, you your parents moved around a lot, or your your mom with you moved around a lot in two different places when you were younger. So oh geez, yeah, yeah. I, I stopped counting. I, when I was like twenty two, I think we moved like thirty six times. You know. Um, I had three fathers, you know, my mother divorced, you know, three times. And in between all that, there was these constantly, we were gypsies, basically. And uh, my mother used to tell me, she had an expression. Uh, what did she say? Uh, uh, your home is where you're sitting. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yeah, it's just it's a fragmented uh, lifestyle as a young man, a boy. Yeah, interesting. And do you think your creativity also comes from there because you have like a different different um, um, experiences in different places with different people all the time? So you know, like there's lots lots of different influences that come come into your mind. And do you think like your creativity mm -hmm. might be coming from there, or does it come from somewhere else? Yeah, uh, no, I think you're born with it. I really do. I believe that you're born with this this creative this creative gene. You know. And uh, so it's inside you, and then your environment plays a big role, of course. Yeah, I, I believe that. I mean, maybe it's 50% DNA and 50% environment. I really okay. don't know. And um, so, for example, um, why, why I'm asking those questions is um, because like, uh, people can't see you because we don't record the video, but uh, I can see you. And You're I've lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Face for the radio. <laughs> so, <laughs> I used to be handsome. <laughs> no, just joking. But um, in in the background, they, uh, there are lots of uh, different pieces of art, and um, I see a lot made with wire. And uh, this is how yeah. I also like um, got to know your work um, for the first time. Like when Lars, um, my cousin, who was also on the podcast, um, two times actually, once in German, once in English, and um, he he showed me. Oh, some I didn't. I didn't know there was English. I had to check out the English version. I didn't see that. Oh yeah, you've only seen the German version. Yeah, yeah okay. Good. Yeah, I wasn't paying attention because it's in German. <laughs> But yeah, okay, that's cool. Yeah, there's also like sorry a, to interrupt. No, that's so good. Yeah, no. Um, I, I, to finish my question is, um, so what um, what brought you into that? Because um, now now I can see like all the different. There's a chair and there's a fan and there's a guitar and there's a um, like flat Earth. <laughs> no, it's just joking. There's like an Earth on yeah. top of your uh, on your on the yeah. ceiling and so so what what gave you the idea on on, on creating something like this with wire? Well, so, yeah, okay, I, I, I'm old enough to have, like, kind of dissected myself a little bit, you know, and uh, so I like minimalism, and I also like uh, to be like a child. I, I, I just want to work with my hands, you know? I don't want a lot of tools, because when you have a lot of tools, you, you're dependent on that tool, right? It breaking or needing a new one or whatever, you know? And I'm like, oh, God, you know, I, I mean, I didn't know this at the time, but this is what I'm looking back at. Uh, and I just want to create with my hands and a pair of pliers to, to cut it or crimp it in certain situations. But basically, it's my hands, right? And then I remember, uh, I was a little boy also, but at the same time as photography phase, you know, that I started becoming aware of that. I remember I used to do this weird thing. And I don't know if all boys do this or all kids generally do this, but I, I would have a tendency to look at something and uh, an object. And I would look at, I would trace it the outline of the, of the, like a vase, I would just like look at it and I would trace around it. And oftentimes I remember using my finger, like going around it for some reason, all the way around the edges. And I don't know why I did that, but I did that. It was inside me to do that. And then that dawned on me, like after I started doing wire, I was like, oh my God, I remember doing that as a little boy, you know? So I'm obsessed with line drawing and uh, I'm obsessed with technique too, you know, like, so a lot of these pieces I do, if you go to my website, you'll see a lot of like, a, a big window into the to my world of wire uh like i like to create everything out of one piece that was my thing you know get give you all the information that i need to give you of what it is as minimally as possible uh but not give you too much information because if i give you too information it becomes a craft and you're not able to like project yourself into it right so i want to give you just information that's a fish bowl for example and then you can project like the color of a fish or what kind of fish it is you know what i'm saying uh, so I'm obsessed with minimalism and line drawing and, and things of this nature so that the wire fit my personality to a T. Mm -hmm. And the wire, is it one piece of wire 
always or are there like different ones put together? In the, be in the beginning, it was all one piece. And then I started having more complicated ideas. And so I just, so there'd be like a puzzle, you know, of different uh, uh, pieces of it that create the bigger whole, the bigger piece of art. Um, and each piece that I did, I'd want it to be the, as much as one line as possible. Like, let's say, for example, if it's a portrait of someone uh, and it has a frame around it, I like to do frames with portraits, like old school, you know, like a, look like it's a real portrait, but it's actually just line drawing. You know? So it's three dimensional. So the portrait will all be one piece of wire and the frame will all be pe one piece of wire. And then later on, I started adding details in the frame. So those would be individual pieces like flowers, let's say, for example, you know. Um, so it, the more complicated the piece, the more um, I'm able, I feel okay using multiple strands of wire. Yeah, it's it's still very impressive. Like, I mean, you, you should see this guy's like <laughs> some of his stuff. Um, I mean, we will definitely put your website um, in, into yeah. the show notes so people can can check it out. But yeah, it's yeah, uh, it's hard to see in pictures because it's transparent, right? You know, and sometimes it has like a three D effect, so it's like like the um, yeah. like you have like an Earth, like half of the Earth. It's like on your on your ceiling, right? Yeah, and it's 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 also coming out, so it's uh, yeah, very cool. And also, um, I um, realized when I was at your shop um, the other day um, in Winwood, and I uh, saw that you use a lot of stuff that is like recycling. For example, like uh, cans where you used um, the little. Uh, I don't know how to call the thing that opens the can. You know, it always comes with the so can. So that's Adriana's work. Oh, that's Adriana's Wait, work. She, okay. Yeah, she does found objects and things of this nature as well. She, that's that's what actually is one of these things that ties together. She likes to work with metal. And uh, she she works with mainly found objects or recycling uh, hardware items, let's say, whatever, that she finds into making her image. Okay, cool. And and uh, why you are like where where do you get the wire from? Do you can you just buy it in a hardware store or something? And then you just oh. no, uh, you know. So I uh, there is some wire you can buy. Uh, there's a simple wire called uh, there's two names for it. There's baling wire and tie wire, depending on where what culture you come from. And that's just like a annealed wire. It's 16 gauge and it's flexible. Um, it can cut you. I mean, you, you went to, once you cut the wire, I mean, it's really sharp, so it, it, can, it can cut you pretty good. And it has memory because it's wire. Uh, but the, a lot of the wire I use, I, I jumped up to using um, 16, 12, and 10 gauge, and 10 gauge being the thickest. And I get that from many years ago. I had a studio that was open to the public because I was in the art center, as I mentioned earlier. And this one dude uh, walked in and he was like, hey, yeah, I really love your work. Uh, is there anything I can do for you? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. What do you What do? You do? And he goes, well, this is my I'm car. A stripper. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I got a pole in the back. This is perfect. <laughs> but anyway, um, and so it turns out this guy, you know, makes wire. He has a, he has a company, in, you know, uh, called Millennium Steel and Wire Company in New Jersey. He's the owner of it. And so he... For years, it just, I'd make a phone call like, "Yeah, yeah, get me whatever, you, get me whatever you want," you know. So I get it comes in pounds, uh, that length, and I get like you know 100 pounds of wire, you know. So that's where I get mine now. So cool. it's awesome. I have sponsorship. Yeah, oh, nice. that's so cool. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I also I want to ask you a few more questions about your shop now um, because we've talked about it a few times, and um, I found it very interesting because the last time I came to Miami in 2017. And I met you then, um, and um, like um, uh, you didn't have the shop back then, right? So it's just like when when did you just when did you start the shop, or when did you open the shop? Uh, well, we t 17. I, it's hard for me. Time is really hard for me to measure. But uh, we've had shop for seven years, two years at the current location that you were at, and five years at another location that was like this little enclave in okay. North Miami, mm -hmm. and nobody went there. It was like really like desolate area. Uh, and we got it for free, the shop, you know. Um, I don't know if this bores you, this little story, but no. so when I start, okay, well, when I started doing <laughs> it, near the end of Adriana's tenure at the art center, she was there nine years. I was there nine years too, but I was three years behind her, so I had three more years left. And in that transition for leaving the art center, which was her income, you know, because you did very well at the art center. Uh, people come in from all over the world and galleries and whatever, you know, it's amazing. And so you can make a living doing that. And as she was leaving, she was like panicking like for income. 
And I said, well, you know, why don't we start? Uh, I always want to do T-shirts, right? For whatever reason, I've had this click inside me to take my line drawing idea and put it on a T-shirt. And I started, I got an old uh, Singer sewing machine, just you know, the cheap one, $50 version, you know. And I, I bought a, um, a zigzag footer. It's because it's called zigzag, zigzag stitching. So I bought a footer for it. And um, I started making these T-shirts freehand, I call it, right? And, uh, you know, I researched how to do it and all that jazz through YouTube. And uh, I, and she really liked the T-shirts. And she said, yeah, let, let's do this, you know, somehow. We'll just start selling them somehow, you know. And I asked a friend of mine, which I never asked for help from anybody. It's just my nature. I do it myself. But I asked my friend, good friend of mine, David also his name. I said, do you know anybody that would be willing to sell our T-shirts, any shop owner? And he goes, you know, Dave, I just had a blind date with someone yesterday who has a shop in this one location that I mentioned in North Miami. And uh, why don't you, you know, go there? I'm like, yeah, sure. So she loved the t-shirts and she started selling them. Three months later, she said, you know, uh, I'm out. I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, and the lease is paid up for three months. Do you want to take over the shop? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> you know, it'd be awesome. And I had told Adriana, she'll tell you this. I told her, I said, what we need to really get this business going is a free store someplace so we don't have to worry about rent. And like everybody, she would say, oh, that's crazy, Dave. That's never going to happen. I'm like, yeah, that's what we need. And sure enough, this happened, right? And after three months, the owner of the little enclave, it's like a little shopping center, I call it sort of like a mix of like Berlin and tropical. They mix together. It's a very beautiful little area. Um, uh, Berlin only because it's like nondescript buildings that he built, you know, like concrete, you know, with just glass window, whatever. It, it, but he, it was in a garden, you know, and he painted the floor, beautiful mosaic uh, uh, tapestry on the floor and everything. So it was a really stunning little spot. It was just secluded. Anyway, so he's, he, instead of asking for rent, he traded T-shirts for, uh, for rent. And then I told her what we really need is a free shop someplace in the busiest neighborhood in the world, <laughs> you know? And I did say this. And she was like, oh, Dave, that's never going to happen. Well, so Adriana has friends of a friend who had this open shop in Winwood, right? Just before COVID, like two weeks before COVID. And um, <laughs> so we, she invited us to participate, not as an equal partner, but just have a little rack in the back because we were established artists and people knew us. And it'd be good for them because they were new to Miami. And this would be good to draw people to the store and, you know, give, give them a little bit of credibility, I guess, was her thinking. And she also liked what we were doing. So we had this little rack in the back, you know, and I brought my uh, embroidery machine there. And um, two weeks later, they lock everything down, right? <laughs> and two weeks later, they start panicking because there's no money coming in and the rent is like, you know, enormous. And uh, they scramble. They say, okay, we're out. And uh, so I go to the owner of the, of the, um, the building who is the, I call him the godfather of Winwood. I mean, he basically built Winwood. It was his brainchild. And uh, I said, look, we can stay, you know, he knew Adriana's work. He didn't know my work, but he knew Adriana's work because we had her work there, you know, and so, and uh, we hit it off because we were from the same background, sort of Brooklyn, you know, that kind of thing. He said, yeah, yeah, stay for free. So we stayed for free, like for six months, I, I think. And then we started paying rent slowly. Uh, and now we're into the, you know, thousands of dollars. I don't want to talk about that. It's crazy shit. But um, so we got, yeah. So I, I, I kind of realized, you know, I don't know if there's a, a lesson in all this or, or whatever, but I think we have to ask people for help sometimes. And we have to be willing to dream big and vocalize our dreams, you know, like if you want to be a, a worldwide DJ, just say it, you know, you have to work hard for it, obviously. Right. That goes beyond that. Uh, saying to the universe, I need your help somehow. Mm. I don't know if it makes any sense, but no, that makes that makes total sense. I think it's it's very important to sometimes seek help from from our surrounding, and even if it's a universe or if it's your neighbor or whoever whoever you can reach out to, I, I think sometimes this is important. It's also, like um, yeah, dream big is is something. Um, I would rather change it to plan big because <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> plan, yeah. plan, um, you know, it already involves like some actions and uh, dreaming is yeah. just, you know, like a state of not being conscious. <laughs> so, um, dude, that's true, right? But very uh, well said. 
but on the other side, I, I I know what you mean by it, and I totally agree with that too. And I think if you if you want to do something in particular, yeah, you can you can you know you can go for it. If, I mean, speaking as a white male from a Western society, you know, where we're from. So this, yeah. is, this is something we can, can definitely say. And I think this is also important, um, you know, for others that are like, like us, um, you know, can understand that yeah, if you want to change the world to something better, yeah, you can, you can go for it and you, you should go for it because it's always, it's always a good choice and also plan something big. It's also a good choice. And I'm I'm curious now with the uh, with the shop um, because uh, when you enter the shop, there's um, a big animal greeting you. Um, <laughs> what's the name the of the cow? <laughs> what's the name of the animal? <laughs> yeah, explain a little bit the background of the cow. <laughs> oh, you love Daisy. I saw you. Uh, yeah, you love Daisy. <laughs> um, fondling my cow. Uh, well, the cow. We have a lot of art there that's not ours. That's sort of um, handed down. And there's a man that Adriana and I are both friends with. He was a friend of, when I lived in Chicago, um, and I'm sorry if some of these stories are boring, but I, everything's a tangent of, of, of something historic that happened in my life. You know, it's part of like how we get, get stuff in life, right? And um, so I had this studio, um, my photography studio in this building in, in Chicago, and the owner really liked liked me uh, he was a really old guy he was like 80 years old back then you know he really liked me and um he liked my work and uh, there was an art gallery downstairs and uh, he was going out of business and he says hey you know i, I like your work and i like adriana you met adriana you know, she's a lovely woman would you like to take over the the gallery for free <laughs> like yeah <laughs> why not <laughs> so we started mounting shows and shit like that and his good friend his best buddy was this uh um, this man that befriended us as well. And he's still alive. He's like, yeah, 98 years old, something like that. And he self-made man, one of these guys that used to sell like refrigerators in 1930s or something like door to door refrigerator salesman. And he made a fortune and he just made millions, you know, and he had this idea. He was an interesting fellow. He had this idea to mimic or rip off. I call it. Uh, bentwood chairs remember the bentwood chairs like the old rocker chair that it's kind of iconic yeah in the countryside they're usually like outside of the house yeah okay mm -hmm. yeah it, indeed well he had this idea to make this bentwood out of plywood steamed plywood so he was the first one to create this and he didn't patent it he would always tell me and the chinese ripped him off you know and just but he made millions of dollars off of it while he had this idea you know and so anyway, so he used to travel the world, this guy, everywhere in the world. The carpet that was in the in the shop, that version carpet was his. He gifted it to us. Anyway, long story short, so wherever he goes, he would collect artwork. Uh, he liked to support the artist, you know, and uh, he bought this cow. <laughs> and uh, it was done by a, I think he told me he was like a, an art farm guy. He bought it someplace in Iowa, I think, is what he told me. And it's, it's, so it's been around a while. So I think it's like 60 years old. That's it. Yeah, that's Not a very cool. interesting story. No, it, it is an interesting story. And also, um, what I we had a, a brief conversation about this at the shop. Um, but uh, there's there are a lot of shirts and um, pieces of art uh, that has a fungi or like some sort of mushroom on it. Um, mm -hmm. I think even on the shirt you're wearing today, <laughs> I can see there's I think a oh, mushroom yeah. on it too. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, Alice in Wonderland with mushrooms. Yeah. <laughs> my, my take on it. Yeah. So, what is um, what is your relationship with mushrooms, and why what it uh, um, on the mm. on the shirt and on on your like art? Uh, my first experience with mushroom was in Brazil when I was visiting there many many years ago. Before we moved there, uh, Adriana's family has a farm in the farm belt of Brazil. It's in the interior, like four hours from the big city of São Paulo, and the father has a, had. Well, he died recently, but uh, he had this bit, this farm, like nine hectares. I forgot what they call it, hectares. So it's a pretty decent size. And they had cows there, you know. And the first thing that Adrian liked to do was pick the mushrooms, you know. So she introduced me to the mushroom. And um, she would always draw mushrooms. She was always into it because she did it living, coming from a small farm town. You know, she had experience with it before I did. And then my first experience was that we picked this giant mushroom. It must have been whew, five inches across the head. And uh, 
And the fun part was searching for them, you know, following the cat, you know, the cows and their in their poop, you know. So and, you're, you're uh, talking specifically about um, uh, mushrooms with psilocybin, so magic mushrooms. Yeah, that w this is where it all began was the psilocybin mushroom, and um, after that experience, fast forward. Um, I like to listen to people who are like these bona fide gurus of, of mushroom uh, life. Uh, Terence McKenna was the first one. Uh, you know Terence, right? I yeah. think, did we speak of that? Terrence? Yeah. And, um, and then uh, Paul Stamets. Yeah, Paul Stamets is the big one. Uh, he is the, uh, he's the guru of mushroom uh, uh, research. And, um, but not just psilocybin, you know, like the, uh, the ones that are healing, that have healing properties. They all have healing properties. Anyway, I started doing my deep dive in the mushroom world, you know, and uh, similar to what you see in that movie, Fantastic Fungi, I think it's called. Yeah, the documentary on yeah. Netflix, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. and Paul Stamets is in that as well. Um, but I mean, I knew all about that before I saw the movie, because uh, I, I tried to do my deep dive on it and find out more about them and uh, how humans are very closely related to the mushroom which he talks about that in the, in the uh, documentary. And um, so I just want to keep talking about mushrooms. I want people, I mean, it's, it's becoming that way. We're, we're legalizing finally in this country, in certain spots around the country, uh, the research of, you know, psychedelics and how it helps the uh, depression and other illnesses, right? Um, so I'm a big fan of mushrooms. That's really it. Uh, I think it's good for us to consume them. And even it, in light doses, the psilocybin is really wonderful, you know? Uh, so yeah, big fan, big fan. <laughs> cool, oh, I like that. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think people should learn a bit more about what they are, uh, what they can attribute to our society, and what's what you know, like what's the advantage of them mm -hmm. having them around us. And so yeah, I, I think it's it's good to have people like you who promote them a little bit more and don't demonize it. Like it's mainly from oh, yeah, <laughs> from, yeah. from the politicians well, or from, from the from the yeah. people in power. That's yeah, it's a really weird behavior. Sorry, you were saying. Well, I remember you were telling me that you you did larger doses. Now I haven't gone to that extent yet you know and i'm fascinated with people like you who have uh, experienced something that's uh, ethereal you know like you uh, seeing the molecular structure of of objects yeah know. i mean this is this is something that's not recommended um for like for anyone so i'm like a disclaimer here so we can't um it's not we should we don't promote it in any way and i think everything has to be uh taken with uh, care and um under supervision if possible like um you know have someone around you so you're safe you're in a safe environment set and setting is it's it's very important and uh, and oh, all yeah. those things Agreed. so yeah. You need a mentor for that. You can't do it yourself. There's no doubt about that. So yeah, I think and and this this um, larger doses. I mean, this this a few years ago we had this conversation because of um, sometimes I feel it's a bit strange when people. Um, you know, like sell you mushrooms if it's in a place where you can bu um, buy them legally or illegally or whatever. But if you in, mm. in certain countries, you can buy mushrooms like in, in um, the Netherlands, for example. Also in, in mm. Mexico, there are some places where um, it's uh, accepted. So there are little towns where they have like shops and they sell mushrooms everywhere. Um, mm. So um, and I've been to those areas and I find it fascinating that people offer you mushrooms um, based on your experience with them and they offer you larger doses if you um, uh, if you have a lot of experience and um, that's, that's why we had this conversation because I said to you like mm. I don't I don't need um, like a large dose because I don't want this, those experiences anymore where you know like you lose your ego like you have this I don't know how you can call it, but you think you're dying, but you're not dying. You know that you're not dying, but you're also dying mm -hmm. somehow. You know, it's it's kind of it's it's a mm -hmm. mixed mixed feeling, and I think it's very hard um, uh, if you if you are preconditioned, if you have something like uh, a mental health issue, and you carry this um, into this experience. I think it can be uh, more harmful that it's actually helping you. So yeah, this uh, I think yeah, I agree. needs to be yeah. said for people to be very careful, and um, even in Germany, well, that's, uh, yeah. Sorry. No, go ahead. I just wanted to say in Germany they sold mushrooms legally um, until like I don't know 2003 or 2004 and then they changed the laws around and you could order them online and now you can't order them online anymore and they're so demonized mm -hmm. and, and I agree with you I think there's so much potential for a society and um, 
yeah again like if 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 this if this can help people or even if they if they have like recreational experience with it i think this can also be beneficial i rather like you know when when people say like oh i don't do mushrooms um, but i drink alcohol and then i think to myself like yeah like what's worse you know like i don't i don't see yeah. like many people with the bad experiences of mushrooms yeah. but I, I see like so many no. people having bad experiences with alcohol so yeah i don't know that's my personal yeah opinion. No, i agreed yeah it's it's interesting that the, the the fungi you know um i've been talking about lately well for a while now but every once in a while it comes back into my conversation that we need to like um, rethink everything, including death, you know? And I think that uh, instead of putting people in, in caskets when they die or burning them, just bury their body in a hole with uh, mycelium spores, you know? And uh, the fungi will eat that body just like it does a piece of fruit or any rotting corpse. And uh, it, it can become a tree. You know, and instead of cemeteries that, that 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 honor death, you should have cemeteries that have trees in it. Like that's Uncle Bob, which is that like mango tree, for example. You know, and so that is really the the cycle of life right there before us. If we could just sort of like think of it in, in that in those terms, you know, uh, just let, let's let fungi become part of our life in death as well as in life. You know, they support our immune system. I'm talking about, you know, not psilocybin necessarily. Yeah, like there's so many use cases for mushrooms or fungi. Um, I mean, there's also the use case for clothes, for like textiles and, and all those things, which can be very sustainable. And um, and also for, um, yeah, for like food in general. I mean, they're very rich in nutrition. They have like protein and lots of minerals and stuff in it that are good for you, you know. So not only the psilocybin, like fungi in, in general, I think is, is such a fascinating field. So I, I think it's so cool that you that you promote it a little bit, you know, and, and um, that people have like more awareness about them and, and have this conversation with others. Because if you wear a shirt where there's a big mushroom on it, like you'd usually start <laughs> a conversation like this. So Indeed. Uh, I'm it's happy true. Yeah, the shop it does do that. <laughs> yeah, the shop that is sort of like a, a, vo a focal point for that, you know. There's no doubt about it. I had some interesting conversations like what we had, you know, about with people because they see the shrooms everywhere, you know. Because there are really some, well, we're an art shop. So we're not getting someone who's just going to go to, let's say, Nike store. They're going to be someone with as a curious mind, right? And uh, so, yeah, it's great to have these conversations and try to keep uh, expanding our knowledge, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Um, so where can people go? Um, oh, maybe explain like, um, here like how they can find your shop uh, or where, where can people go to find out more about you? Oh, yeah. Um, so we have, a, 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 we call it the Pink Bastard Art Shop. Instagram, it's Pink Bastard Art Shop, one word. And uh, we have our address there. It's in Wynwood, Miami. And I'm there seven days. Well, today I took a day off. But, uh, <laughs> for this interview, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, I took the day off for Ben, that's right. Um, uh, but yeah, so we're there. Uh, we're open seven days, basically. And uh, we're the open door and open heart, ready to greet and meet anyone. Nice. And why Pink Bastard? Um, oh gosh, you know, when I was talking to Adriana, when, when I told you earlier that, um, she was at the end of her time at the art center, uh, we sat down at my table and we're discussing, um, names for our business, you know, and, uh, <laughs> it's a combination of this stuffed animal. It's a pig that I bought Adriana when I first met her. And this stuffed pig has a personality. Um, it smokes cigarettes. It, it's a, it, it, it's, this pig is really quite something. And um, it, we call it a pink bastard or pink bitch or something like that. You know? And when we were coming up with the name for the shop, I said, why don't we call it pink bastard? And her reaction was similar to like everybody that, that um, um, I met at that time. They said, well, well, she laughed, of course, because it's funny. But then you start realizing you're really going to call a shop Pink Bastard. And um, before it became, a, but that was before it became a uh, show. We were also an art forum. So we organized art exhibits with other artist friends. Uh, we haven't done that in a while. Uh, but that's on the pinkbastard.com website. You'll see the art forum and also the, the, uh, the art shop where we do the embroidery. Uh, but anyway, so uh, 
everybody was saying, oh, Dave, you can't call it Pink Bastard. You know, nobody's going to like it and you're not going to get anywhere with that kind of name. And I'm like, well, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know like, maybe that's the rebel artist in me, right? I'm just going to do what I want. And there's no rules. I, don't, I hate rules, do you know? I've been fighting against rules my whole life. You know, I don't like rules. And, um, I mean, certain rules make sense. You know, you know what I mean. But just rules generally. I, I 100% agree with you there. So, <laughs> that's all good. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, uh, now I like the name. You know, people laugh. They giggle when they see the name. Uh, it's memorable. And it's also kind of, I don't know if this, is it ironic? Because pink represents something. They use pink in color theory. You know, like uh, for the prisoners, they'll, put pink in the room and it calms him down and relaxes these people. Yeah, it's a pretty color. And then bastard. Uh, so it's like contradiction, pink bastard. So I sort of like that. Um, it's just, it's just whimsical as hell. Mm. Oh, that's funny. Okay. Now I know why the, where the name comes from. And um, yeah, so if you, um, so this show is called unpopular people, but, imagine you would be popular so you would fill the stadiums and you would like uh you know like have millions and millions of, of followers and and people around you like all the time and um would you be different than you are now like would you act differently or do you do you think you would have yourself under control or do you want this at all or? uh it wouldn't change me at all i mean i know that I alluded to earlier, you know, I talk to you like I would talk to the president. I don't really care. You know, I'm judging character, right? So I, I don't think I would change, you know? And I also believe that, uh, and I carry this with me, uh, uh, humbleness is, is, the, is the key to create a longevity, you know? So if I'm on that big stage, it's because I'm creative. I'm doing something creative that they like. And so uh, in order to maintain that, it's being humble because whoever's in front of you has something to say that's interesting, that can inspire you. So, no, I wouldn't change me. And would I want that? I used to. As I've gotten older, my, my priorities have changed dramatically. I'm, this is nothing new. I'm, I'm sure people feel the same, but I don't want to conquer the world. I have no interest. And I don't really need to be wealthy. I can live very humbly. Uh, I'm happy. You know, I mean, I, I do live humbly. I could live in a sand dune, and I would be satisfied with that. You know, so I... I, I I'm getting angry with people that are so obsessed with wealth. I feel this anger inside me, this capitalism. I, I, I believe it stems from capitalism. Maybe it's just human nature, that's it. Because capitalism comes from human nature, right? But um, I, I find it really um, disturbing to see how people worship wealth and money. And so at this point in my life, I don't need that, you know, big state with all that money. Because that's money comes with that, right? That vast wealth. I know it's power to be able to influence people. So maybe in that, in that way, if you could help somebody, inspire them, you know, they inspire you, then you can inspire them. And that big platform might be helpful. But I don't really think about it. I don't know. I really don't. What is inspiration for you? Like when you say to inspire people, what does inspiration mean? Uh, expanding one's consciousness, you know. Think about something that you didn't think before. You tell me something politically, let's say, or... Maybe not creatively, but more like something specific, you know. Um, um, nurture my knowledge, you know. If someone could say something, that inspires me. But no, actually, that's not true. Creatively as well. Uh, people inspire me all the time creatively, you know. Uh, I did a, a, a T-shirt. I stitched a T-shirt the other day because she saw one of my wire portraits. She saw a necklace that said, fuck off, you know. I have a wire necklace around this portrait, that wire portrait. And she says, you know, you should put that on a T-shirt, you know. And I'm like, oh, that's a good idea, you know? <laughs> and I did it, exactly, that day I did it. You know? mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, uh, I, I, I kind of went off on a tangent there, so I forgot sort of about the, the gist of the question. But. No, that's, that's all good, Dave. We, we like you to, you know, go to different places during this conversation, so that's, it's great. And uh, I, have, I have one last um, general question, like those, those, like we have like two, three questions at the end that we always ask our guests. And uh -huh. um, for me personally, I, this last question is very important. And um, I'm thinking of the school system that we have in most places in the world. It's in the Western society that we know and grow up in. Um, grew up in that's um we, we know the sort of school system so is there anything you would change or do you think that, what what do we need in our schools to be implemented to be accessible for all kids um so they 
are prepared for for the life we're living right now mm. well, that's that's a really big question i know the history of the school system why they concocted it to be this you know and studying studying from the british empire needing cogs to fill all the, the little jobs so they created the school system that we still use to this day basically you know but i don't know i think we have to teach people to be critical thinkers you know and our system won't allow it they don't want critical thinking and that's why we have the school system that we have uh critical thinkers it's, it's unhealthy for the power structure you know if you have a bunch of people that think, can think for themselves you know um but in the united states you know all our money so we have this system set up capitalism has created a system where it's brainwashes to believe that you shouldn't send your kid to a public school because they're not going to get a good education right and so they create these uh, charter schools or independent schools which are private and cost a lot of money because that's that's the drive is how do we constantly extract money from the population and one of the ways is through schooling and uh, so now we have this uh real class system set up in our country if you go to public school you're way behind uh anyone who's going to like a university level school or private school rather you know um and so that's a real problem and I, how you fix that is just like getting people on the school board that are not or in the uh in electoral politics have it oh my gosh i don't know where to start we have a broken system in this country electoral Uh, electoral uh, our politics uh, how do i say i'm sorry i'm kind of jumping around here because that's such a big question for me no, um, okay so it is a big question <laughs> i admit <laughs> yeah we have a broken system here, uh politically and the, the politics govern how we run our daily lives you know and uh you know, we're constantly they're, they're constantly telling us that To, to punch down you know we have this we have this thing in this country part of our education is that um if you don't make it it's your fault you, you're not smart enough you're not strong enough you didn't go to the right school you didn't you know if you work seven days a week well you got to work 12 hours if you're 12 hours you got to work 14 hours it's just never enough we're educating our people to think like that that it's always your fault we're, we're we're brainwashed to punch down not to look at the system that controls it that's not giving enough money to pri to public schools and and to try to get good quality teachers that go to public school is a real problem also because they're not paid as much right and that starts leading into like this this bad schooling and a bad education for the masses let's say because not everybody can afford to go to private school which gets more expensive every year i don't have kids but all my friends tell me what it costs it's staggering in this country anyway um so we have a real broken system uh but you know the the american way of life is changing and uh i I'm a short-term pessimist that I don't think we're going to have a very rosy uh political well we don't have a very good political structure in this country for sure it's definitely corrupted and um that's dictating the school system the school system it's all by design you know they wanted to create a dumbified citizenry and that's what they got and uh and that's why we have continued wars all around the world that's why we have a thousand military bases around the world the us of course i'm talking about that's why we're the most destabilizing country in the world you know because we keep putting these people in, in into a position of power and we we placate them we let them have what have they let we let them launder our treasury uh, to benefit a handful of people the oligarchs we call the american oligarchs you know You should probably edit all this out, I guess. But <laughs> no, 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 I won't. <laughs> I uh, leave this all in. This is very oh important. Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah. Um, so we've had a dumbified, uh, we had a dumbified citizenry, and even my intelligent friends that they went to university. When I try to have a conversation with them about what's really happened, what really happened with COVID, for example, because I'm a, I'm a critical thinker. I don't believe anything my government tells me. I don't believe anything big corporations tell me, and that's the way it should be. Uh, but everybody for some reason just buys into this shit you know they believe that war we need to have war everywhere in the world because they need our help so what do we do we go and kill people that need our help that doesn't make any sense um it's all basically to funnel money to the to the energy extractors of the world you know all our treasuries going to that all our decisions are are now uh, all based around the war economy 
uh, oil and, and energy economy, uh, big pharma, all our funds, all, you know, if you look at what big pharma is uh, the sponsor, and they sponsor 70% of all of, um, of our media. And so they dictate what the narrative is. Uh, and the, the critical thinkers out there, the ones that are fighting back are being censored because the, the people that control the media uh, uh, platforms, they're the uh, billionaire class, right? And they're in bed with the government because they own the government. They're one and the same and they own the media. So they own everything. And so our education system, uh, I think is a shambles because of it. And so getting back to what my friends were intelligent, they're not intelligent. They're not knowledgeable. They're not critical thinkers. And I'm really disappointed. They broke my heart, actually. A lot of people broke my heart. Uh, um, and I can't have conversations with them anymore about it because they, they think I'm a conspiracy theorist or something, you know, like, oh, Dave, you're just an artist. What do you know? I had one friend that said they would take my opinion seriously if I went to Yale, you know, like they come from that mindset, you know. <laughs> Little does he know if I went to Yale, I'd be talking just like them. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be a critical thinker because that's not what they want in Yale, mm. you know. They want status quo kind of people. Anyway, that's a circle, right? That's a big circle jerk. But, uh, I don't know what to tell you about this education thing. Yeah, it's, I, I root for the Germans. I pray for the Germans to help us. I pray for the, the Europeans. I, I, always, I always put the, the Europeans on a pedestal you know, in terms of being critical thinkers. Uh, I'm really disappointed with that too now, though, you know, frankly. Yeah. And I think even the Europeans are being bamboozled by the uh, neoliberal uh, narrative, you know. Yeah, but we need um, more critical thinkers like yourself and uh, we need to have this conversation at least, you know, you can have different opinions or different approaches to um, to an issue that we have in the world and at the moment politics, politics is not solving it, so we need um, new ideas and uh, maybe new systems that, um, you know, can guide us through this mess and um, one important thing is education and I think if you if you implement some sort of critical thinking where you analyze an issue and you are trying to solve it from different angles instead of just using one uh, one direction that's been always used in the past so it must work with this problem as well it's not how things um, can be solved so I, I agree with you there like we need more critical thinking and if this is something we can implement in school so yeah that's uh, probably a, a good way <laughs> to go and that's, mm. that's, a, that's, a, that's a very nice answer that uh, yeah I was hoping for and I received again <laughs> because we mm. always we always receive very very that's why I, um, for me education is, is key for so many things and as we say in our slogan like um, um, listening and learning from each other, which is nothing else but education, mm. Um, uh, mm. is, is, is key for personal development and success. Yes, so you, were, you mm. wanted to say something. You know what I think also, you just pointed to something, a uh, uh, tangent of an idea about education. You know, like, uh, this is not nothing new, but uh, if we could just, God forbid, we could take our children and uh, teach them and find what that narrative is inside them, you know, and let them be what, what's good for them, not for money. You know, don't be a doctor because you, it's just good for money, you know. Don't be a teacher because, well, you need a job and I, I don't have others. Figure out what you're good at, for God's sake, you know. I mean, I don't think it's asking too much. No. Just teach our children, you know, nurture them in a better way. I don't know. Yeah. We need, we need more we need more experts and we need more people, like, like real experts, like people that, that are very very uh, how do you say proficient proficient in in their field and they know they know mm. what they're doing because they've they have uh, many experiences or they have enough emotional social and logical intelligence to to answer the questions that need to be answered at the moment and you have a few mm -hmm. of them you know so they can work together and they can look at each other's hands like what oh this is the way you do it or oh, i have an, a different way maybe we can combine those two or maybe we use this instead of this and you know so you can yeah. find solutions for for the things we're struggling to handle at this at this time so yeah beautiful um, set, yeah. Yeah. so Dave, um, I don't want to hold you back much longer already. Like it's, uh, your, it's your free, so day, free, free day today, and uh, I, I, I want you to, you know, enjoy it a little bit. <laughs> it's because it's no, I thoroughly, I thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, and seeing your handsome face, it was all, even better. Yeah, the cherry for, on for, top for me as well. <laughs> like seeing your handsome <laughs> face, it always makes my day. 
No, it was really nice to <laughs> yeah. catch up again also the other day when I came to your shop and I um, I highly recommend um, all the listeners if you're somewhere in Windward or Florida or like Miami area so come come mm. by um, Dave's shop it's it's a very good experience and um, you can have a good chat with him and you can buy a cool cloth and you can look at cool art and there's there's so much to see so you should definitely check it out um, also like um, we will link uh, your website um, as well so people can maybe find out some more of your work and if you want to give me some more like I don't know if you want to share your Facebook or Instagram if you have anything like that um, with us that's um, that's up to you we're gonna put this in the show notes for our listeners and yeah so thank you very much from my side um, yeah. I think I, I said enough and um, I have so many more yeah. questions but I can stay in touch with you um, so yes absolutely and um, I'm, I'm very grateful for this I'm very grateful for this conversation so again I say goodbye from my side if there are any final words from you now is the time for it well no thank you it was a real pleasure seeing you again and uh, I'm grateful that you think I'm interesting enough to be the, uh, on your, pod, your podcast so uh, I look forward to seeing you again in person uh, New Zealand I think I'm making plans to go to so uh, uh, I look forward to it thank you so much <laughs>